Hello, animators and artists. Jamie Green is a professional rigging artist who describes his day-to-day -day work as solving art jigsaw puzzles for a living. Jamie's worked with a list of studios, which includes Boulder Media, a productions cartoon saloon, and Jam Media. In his spare time, he created a character rig based on a design by his colleague Rowan, uh, Rowan Sefton. And Jamie Green joins our live stream to take us on a tour of his Harper rig. So welcome to the stream, Jamie. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for joining us, Jamie. So uh, how do you describe your role as a rigging artist, and what does a typical day look like in that role? Um, the role of a rigging artist, um, I've always seen it as kind of the bridge between animation and design. Um, it's one of these things where it, <laughs> it's a little bit of a mystery what happens in between that part. But there's a lot of times where sometimes a design uh, could include certain elements that might actually hinder an artist. So um, there's a huge part of that as well that goes into rigging. Day-to-day, um, -day, what a day-to-day -day looks like. Um, well, I would say the hardest part of my day is trying to find something to listen to, to be honest. Uh, like after that, it's mostly just kind of getting down into the node view. Um, it's one of these kind of uh, jobs where you might have this uh, assignment for five days, couple of weeks at times. Um, so you're really kind of like working step by step, kind of checking in, making sure that you're kind of happy with it, um, hoping everything works out by the end of the two weeks. Uh, and that's very much kind of um, the day-to-day -day of rigging um, when you're on the, the floor. Um, if you're working as a lead, it's mostly kind of putting out fires, finding patches, uh, doing the meetings, kind of uh, technical support, uh, depending on the production. Um, sometimes there might be a pipeline crew or technical director, and a lot of the time the responsibility would then fall to rigging. Um, it's kind of our bread and butter to know the software very well. So um, if the artists are really trying to get, hit their deadlines, it really shouldn't fall to them to solve the, any kind of technical issues. Um, a rigger would be able to help you out with that if you're on the, the harmony section of the pipeline, of course. So one thing you mentioned is like a part of your day is finding what to listen to while you're working. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've got to, I have to ask then, um, for people who are working on uh, stuff like rigging, uh, what do you like to listen to uh, while you're putting stuff together? Well, um, I think the trick is to diversify it. Uh, don't always listen to the same thing. So like music obviously is kind of the dominant one, something you can kind of tune in and out of. Um, podcasts, obviously, uh, a lot of the time if you're in any kind of animation groups, it's kind of asking recommendation for podcasts. But um, a real, a one that really flies under the radar is stand-up comedy, because you can kind of tune in and out of that. Uh, and, oh my god, uh, John Mulaney is kind of my go-to guy. Uh, Norm MacDonald, who I think is the best Canadian comedian, uh, love him. It's uh, an untapped resource by a lot of animators. You don't need the audio, so it's it's brilliant in that sense. Um, the, the annoying one actually is uh, audiobooks because mm. that actually requires more concentration than you can afford. So I, I've tried it. There's been a few books I've tried while I've been rigging and what ends up happening is uh, after the chapter ends, I have to go on Wikipedia and read what I just listened to um, just to figure out like what I've missed. Like uh, that key incident might just be one or two lines and then the rest is just reacting to it. And you're like, wait, what happened? What? So you have to go back and yeah. So books, books personally, I find quite difficult to listen to. Um, you also don't want to listen to anything too interesting because it <laughs> kind of interrupts the workflow. So it, it kind of has to be a few things here and there where it's like you can, can tune in and tune out a little bit. So it, it, you know what? It's almost an art form in itself. But uh, by God, it is the hardest part of my day. So, Jamie, you've worked for a wide variety of studios in Ireland and in the UK. Uh, so one thing I'm curious is, would you say that, that what a rigging artist does is similar from studio to studio? Or do you find that the expectations can be different on a variety of productions? Um, it is similar. Um, studio to studio. Uh, the first time you've kind of moved studio, it's jarring, everything's a little uncanny, and um, there might be slightly different expectations. The rigging also tends to change. Um, I had the experience, the very fortunate experience of the first company I worked for kind of spread me out on five different shows. So with the first company, I got to learn five different styles and kind of a lot of the kind of variance between them. 
So um, when I moved to my next show and they kind of wanted something very different or something unique to the challenges of their design, uh, you're a little bit more prepared for it. But without having that kind of uh, experience, it can be a little bit jarring um, from what I've heard. But for the most part, like it's it's a really nice industry. Everyone's supportive. So it's never something that you're going to let the team down but, uh, in any kind of regard. Um, the big, th like they are very different studio to studio, but like I'd say the biggest contributor is that a lot of the time it's kind of a mishmash of contract workers with kind of uh, staff in the studio. Um, so a lot of the vibe of the production, uh, the culture of it can very much be informed, which might necessarily reflect on the studio. So it's like, you could go to one place, have a great time, go back, it's a different crew and you're kind of like, oh, the spirit's not the same as it was before. But to be honest, I haven't had a bad experience in any of the studios I've worked in, really. Um, it's all very been very positive experiences. So uh, if you are in your first studio and you're thinking about moving to the next one, it's like, I wouldn't be worried. Um, it's all good. So the character that I wanted to ask you about for this live stream was the Harper rig that you posted a demo of on LinkedIn. What can you tell us about Harper? <sighs> Probably too much. Uh, Harper, Harper was, uh, she was originally made for a story I had in my head um, and she ended up becoming, becoming a experimental rig. So if I ever had any ideas in a production that I couldn't really do during company time or just wouldn't be responsible to do, I would tend to um, check out Harper and apply those changes to her. So even, I mean, I think I've rigged her arms five or six different ways, uh, her legs about the same. The, the character has changed so much over the course of it. Um, and then there was some techniques I kind of wanted to show uh, studios. Um, so it was kind of worth kind of actually finally kind of cleaning or putting it off together. Um, and yeah, uh, she's turned out great. I'm very happy with her. Um, there's still a few things I want to kind of work in, uh, a few other techniques to try out. But yeah, she's she, <laughs> she's got some techniques in her that I'm, I'm quite happy with. So you've mentioned that the rig includes like built-in tools for quickly posing the character. Um, would you want to give us a quick walkthrough of how you'd introduce an animator to this rig? Um, well, the way I tend to like to introduce people to rigs is just drop it on their desk. Uh, I kind of want it to be intuitive enough that they could figure it out. Um, one of the things, though, is like they'll, they'll generally only find about 90% of it, and there's a few hidden features in it. So for that, I tend to make uh, tutorials. Um, and I'll kind of post them around or at least inform the, the leads or the animation director. Uh, for example, Harper here, now I should say at this point as well, my Wacom has decided to take a personal day off today. So I'm using the mouse, so my muscle memory might be a little off today, but hopefully people forgive me for that. But um, say, for example, we have uh, her mouth here. Now, this is one of these kind of uh, cases one this is kind of one of these cases where um, what I would what I would say is kind of important for a rig to have is that it's able to be precise as well as quick, right? One or the other. It really depends on the needs of the animator on that day. So say they have a say they have a lip sync they want to do. You want to just be able to kind of like go to the frames, find the right one. Um, really speed up your process that way. But then you might have a case where you want to do a bit more acting with the mouth. Uh, maybe it's biting something off, or maybe she's grinding her teeth. Um, in which case, you want something a little bit more uh, flexible, so to speak. So you can kind of control your mouth movements. And like the posing is never going to be very great with a mouse here. I'm going to do this real quick, so forgive me. But you're able to then put in its own individual individual teeth that you can move around with deformers. These will have their own little library inside. So in this case, the tongue even has extra things going on. You can kind of see down here in the library. Um, and it's one of those things where I want to include, say for just the mouth, uh, options to do it very quickly, and then, but also options then to kind of 
get a bit more precise and get more acting in and a lot more flexibility. So it's one of those things where I generally like to try and include both. It's say the same with the arms, where all of these kind of have envelopes on them um, and would kind of function as you would expect an arm to work, right? Where we have our traditional circles, which is a big technique of the animators, uh, or riggers, I should say. But then we also want to have where we can see this says envelopes on it, we also want rubber hose. So we can see our little thing here has a rubber hose now. And say if an animator just wants to move an arm very quickly and just maybe they're just doing a swing for a walk cycle, you know, it's a lot quicker to then use something as simple as this instead of all of the, the bells and whistles of an envelope deformer. So it's nice to have that uh, option inside of it. Um, the hair is kind of another example where if you were to go up here and turn on all of its deformers, there's a lot going on. Um, and even these, like this is a bluff, this line continuation here, um, it's just made to look like that. So it's one of these things where controlling all of that and posing it all out every frame, it's gonna take you forever. So even just having a little handle where you can kind of select it all together and kind of move it around that way just for a little bit of secondary reaction, that's really gonna save animators a lot of time and really help them out in the long run. So it's good to kind of put in stuff where, you know, it is fully deformable and it can hit those precise movements, but it's also good to give them quick options. Um, I was only talking to a friend today who was saying that uh, he didn't have envelopes on um, a certain character he was working on, but he would always get notes on his poses where it's like, uh, or drawovers particularly, where like, we want you to hit this pose uh, precisely like this. He couldn't do it and he had to end up doing some of the rigging himself as an animator to end up hitting that pose he needed. So you do need to kind of uh, think ahead to include options for speed. Um, sometimes they want the slower one, sometimes wants the faster one. Um, and it's important to give them both. And communication is also a big part of that as well. Um, it's, it's good to talk and check in with your animation director and hear how it's going and what they need. In the case of this uh, mouth, uh, this, this was something the animation director turned in, uh, to me and, eight episodes in, I was like, we would really love something like this. Can this be done? And I was like, no, no, we couldn't. And usually when you kind of communicate with a rigger, um, they're going to want to achieve that. So then it was kind of my business to really figure out how we could do that in the production, uh, kind of, you know, already in the process as well. And yeah, we ended up finding it. He loved it. Um, really, really helped them out and ended up saving them a lot of time. Because uh, otherwise they'll have to draw all this uh, themselves and that means they have to kind of venture into the node view, which if you're not really familiar with Toon Boom, it's scary. It's really intimidating to go in here and just see so much stuff going on and you're just like, what do I do? Like you want to rig for the junior animator who's, who's it's their first day in the industry. You want it to be kind of a friendly experience to go in and not intimidate people. Um, I, <sighs> One of the things I always want to ask if I'm in an interview for a job, I'm like, can I just see your node view? Because like, I care how that's presented more than anything else. Like, It'll really bother me if a node view is a mess and I have to figure it out every time I go into a rig, especially if you're in redresses and things like that. So, oh gosh, guys, it's so important to keep your node view clean and presentable. Um, on that note, I noticed that like your node view has like a, a ton of colored backdrops. Um, it's a very, very neat node view. Do you want to just do a little zoom in so that we can see um, just how pretty this node view is? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, do you know what? My backdrops actually will uh, cause controversy uh, in certain circles. Um, I know sometimes people want the backdrop to cover everything, like every. I just use them aesthetically. Uh, I generally prefer it that way. So we have some things up here as well going on, which might seem strange. Uh, that's how the arm deformer is working, if people want to have a look at that. There's no grouping at the moment, uh, just because it was easier for me visually to kind of have that legibility and see everything as it was kind of making them. They were a bit of a challenge in themselves. So um, you can do complicated stuff and still keep it neat. Like even the head down here, uh, it's the same deal. It's like you, you try to keep it as neat as you possibly can. Um, keep everything labeled uh, to a degree. Um, I wouldn't be one for naming cutters, for example, or anything like that. Uh, 
I know a lot of people sometimes like the name for cutters. Cutter 13 is the perfect name in my opinion. I wouldn't change that to anything else. So um, outside of that, yeah, please, <laughs> please do name all your stuff. So one of the things that we we're talking about before the stream um, is that this rig, the, the design was really a collaboration between you and another artist. Do you want to talk a little bit about that process? Yeah. So the design was done by uh, Rowan Sefton, and she's just a phenomenon. Uh, let me see what I can get for us here. So what, what the crack was, was I was working on this project where I was really, really struggling with a certain design, um, or even a certain principle, really. I wanted something that had design appeal without necessarily being this beautiful girl. It was like I kind of wanted it to be a little bit ugly and insecure and not have a lot of flattering elements to make the design itself seem more appealing. And I really struggled with that. It's really hard to do an appealing kind of ugly girl. Um, Rowan ended up just saving my bacon in that regard. It wasn't just that she knocked uh, one drawing out and was like, let's rig this. She had a whole process of kind of um, concept. Hold on. Um, and it was just amazing to see the stuff that she was producing. So in the end, what it happened to be was more of a kind of a blend of a lot of the styles that were going on. And we kind of found the design itself. Um, so I actually love this page in particular. There's just so much going on. Like all of it actually looks fun to rig. So uh, when we finally kind of settled where we ended up, uh, I was just ecstatic with it. Um, she even kind of came up with a lot of different ideas that uh, I hadn't tried in my own drafts because <laughs> I was trying to design this character and it just it wasn't coming to me at all. Uh, Rowan really did just, oh, she did a phenomenal job. Um, even originally, I was saying like I, I kind of wanted socks in the character um, just to make it kind of seem more homey. She's like, "What about slippers?" And that was a godsend as well because we were able to do a lot of fun animation with the slippers. Then, uh, kind of secondary action with the the, the heel uh, kind of flopping. And so we have it here where we can kind of bring that down now. So we can kind of. When she's lifting up her leg, we can kind of have a flapping flipper in the back. So there was a lot of stuff like that. Like a lot of her ideas were just godsends, absolute godsends. But uh, I can't even remember the question yet. I'm just kind of falling in love with her art all over again. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think like you mentioned that uh, you're struggling to find appeal for the character. And I think appeal is one of those things that when people are just getting into animation and rigging, um, people tend to think that appeal means make it look like beautiful, make it look nice. Um, and that's not really what appeal is. Appeal is like what draws your eye in the way that you need it to be drawn. Exactly. Uh, it, and as simple as that sounds, like I could not achieve that myself. Um, she makes it look so easy, uh, honest to God. But it's like I spend way longer than I care to admit trying to get this character down. And yeah, it's she was just a godsend. Um, and it was a lot of fun actually getting to collaborate this uh, with her. Um, it was, there was a lot of kind of like jokes going on with some hidden references. And like, um, I always was just looking forward to the next thing that she was going to produce. Um, and then I think uh, she had the similar experience when she saw um, the drawing kind of come to life and some of the animation just moving around and what it could actually do. So um, I think we're both very proud of Harper. It's really cool when you can find uh, that sort of collaboration. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, what do you find the most interesting or challenging about the rig's design? <sighs> well, it's one of these things where I kind of had an idea what I wanted the design to be for the longest time. So um, I'd spent so long trying to figure it out um, that I kind of came up with the solutions in my head for a lot of the, the, the rigging problems before they happened. Um, I had a few years to think about it. So um, I would say one of the more challenging aspects was probably the hair. Uh, the hair was just so bulky and there was so much kind of going on at the time that I was kind of worried about how I was actually going to be able to handle it. Um, this was very much kind of, I kind of came up with this for the benefit of this character. 
Um, and that kind of happened a little bit through discovery uh, with the rigging and experimenting. Um, the slippers were also a little bit difficult in themselves, but to be honest, I think that's uh, partly my own draftsmanship with feet. Uh, that kind of contributed to that problem. In terms of rigging, it wasn't too bad, but just kind of like, how would it look at this angle? How does the underside work? So there was a lot of times I had to kind of go back to Rowan and be like, help, please. You know, and she, she'd do some drafts for me and help me out again. So there was a lot of that going on as well. Um, but just because she was an experimental rig as well, there was a lot of times where I went into something not knowing if it was going to work necessarily, like the, the rubber hose and the envelope arm. Um, that only happened because I saw a post uh, from a gentleman who said that they, they didn't think that it was possible to do that. And I kind of had some theories in my head of two or three different ways to do it. This is the way I, um, I ended up landing up and just really uh, quite enjoying that process. Uh, the other two did work, but they kind of had trade-offs. Um, and that's something I generally tend to want to avoid, uh, especially when you're handing it over to an animator. It's like, oh, I can do everything but it's going to do this as well, uh, which is going to cost you X amount of time or, you know, cause the boundary box to be huge. Um, you, you generally don't want to give ultimatums with a solution. So, uh, don't that, bend the arm too far or else it will break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Things like that. So there's a lot of things like that. One of the styles, um, for example, was, I remember we made a version where I couldn't necessarily get ooh, this is this dodgy mouse now, guys. <laughs> where I couldn't necessarily say get the arm in front there. Um, so we ended up we ended up having to kind of make a version that uh, could in the end. Hold on. So there was another two or three versions that couldn't actually accomplish that in the same way. Um, and that kind of needed to be addressed. So there wasn't anything particularly hard necessarily about design. I think I made it hard for myself over the years of uh, changing out limbs and things like that and experimenting. Um, there was a lot of things that I have tried in Harper that didn't work that uh, I was really kind of, you know, spending a couple of hours with my fingers crossed just hoping it all came together and like you know it didn't and you have to go back and redesign it or kind of address flaws that uh, were appearing so um it wasn't necessarily design uh, that was uh hindering us um the hair as i was saying yeah there was a lot going on there and we just needed a quick way to control that but i would say other than that she's actually a very very friendly design to work with yeah, and going back to the appeal, I've noticed that there are a lot of elements that kind of point back towards like the eyes and face, like the uh, sort of stray hairs, um, all kind of point towards the center of that mass, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, I hadn't really thought of that myself. Um, I'm sure Rob intentionally designed it uh, that way. I remember asking that I want things like this just to kind of stress that um, we kind of wanted the hair to look a little bit kind of more rugged and just to kind of uh, get away from that pretty appeal design um so that's initially where that came from uh but i'm sure rowan uh, had uh, grander thoughts than i did <laughs> so you've shared other rigs that you've built in your spare time in the past including an unofficial rig of of rick from rick and morty saying rick and morty rig six times fast <laughs> is, is a challenge um, but how does Harper differ from the Rick rig that you built? So um, in the case of Harper, as I was saying, she was kind of like my guinea pig, like any kind of mad experiments I wanted to try on the rig, it was Harper. Um, Rick was more of a demonstration of uh, strong fundamentals, which uh, if you kind of went through the, the Harper video, it doesn't really go into her fundamentals. Uh, I still use Rick to kind of demonstrate that in the secondary video on my website. Um, he himself actually is still a bit of an experiment. He, um, I chose Rick for a very specific reason. Um, he kind of had this problem in the design that you could come into if you rigged it wrong. I don't know if I should be admitting this. So I rigged it wrong uh, just to see if there was a way around this 
problem. I have him hiding away in here now. Let's see if he wants to come out and play. There we go. So here's the man himself. Uh, keyword as well, unofficial rig. Um, so this is kind of my own guy. Um, the problem I wanted to address. Um, there's a certain principle that we like to use in um, in rigging, where let's say we have this square here. I'm just going to make a second one real quick. Now, if I was to move this square. If I was to move the square now, we're going to see the other side of the square. But we're not going to have that in the case of circles. So we have a blue circle here and a green circle here. And if I rotate that, we're not going to see anything. right? It's kind of perfectly symmetrical in every single direction. right? But if we then put a square on that and a square on this guy, we start getting an arm. OK? Uh, but then, as we were mentioning earlier, uh, vertical stripes are kind of the enemy of the rigor. It's one of those kind of main, main kind of uh, things we tend to flag with design. It's just like, please, please don't put that there. So the reason why is because, as I was saying before, the symmetric, uh, the circle is symmetrical in all directions, whereas now we've broken that. And when I move this, it's not connecting anymore. And then like a an animator is going to have to kind of fix up themselves manually. Like you're going to have to get the formers and link up every time the arm moves, and it's just one of those things that you tend to avoid. So, in the case of Rick, he was a character where I wanted to rig him because he has the same problem. If you rig him to, you know, we've gone too far now. If you want him to do this, that's not going to work. Uh, or at least it shouldn't work. Um, and essentially, the reason is he has two pivot points. In the case of the circle, it's directly in the center. But there's a circle that has to work here as well, right? But the center is here. This is another circle that's happening here, but the pivot is here. But I have it set here. And it was this whole thing of like, how do I actually get these two circles to move together? So you get this, because that's not what happens usually, as we've seen with um, the, the horizontal line. So the whole reason I actually chose to do Rick was intentionally to do him wrong to see if I could get this to work. And as I was mentioning before, you generally don't like to hand off ultimatums to an animator. This is the reason Rick isn't available to people. I don't, I don't want people to, to have to work with this flaw. But he has this kind of crazy thing going on in him where his deformers are actually offset because it's kind of a bluff how this is happening. This might be a little bit boring for advanced users who have figured this out already. But he should. You now, it's been a few years since I rigged this guy. I might have actually lost where I put this. He essentially is told to ah, lads, where have you hidden this? Where have I hidden this? He has a applied peg transformation um, that actually moves the artwork over. I can't believe I can't find it now. Good lord. He has an applied peg transformation. Yeah, this guy's a bit old. He's an applied peg transformation that actually moves the artwork over, right? So the actual artwork is it's over where these deformers are, but this deformer then controls that, and it's just a bluff. Um, but you couldn't hand this off to a animator. Like I would never use this technique in a production. Uh, in fact, I might actually choose to rig him correctly if it was a production rig. But he was just an experiment to see if that would that one aspect would work. Everything else is done very traditionally. Um, and there's nothing that's happening in the video of Rick that um, is disingenuous. Uh, even that flaw, when I turn on the deformers, uh, that actually is in there in the rig when you, um, in the video. So no one ever caught me out in it or called me out in it. So I was kind of expecting that for a few years. And I was like, 
kind of got away with it, and uh, no studio had ever asked to actually download Rick and have a look at him. So um, I kind of knew that the day that that happened, <laughs> I had to remake it very quickly. But um, yeah, he he was still a lot of fun to play with. Like despite that that problem, um, he's still very easy to actually work with. But it's a problem I wouldn't want to hand off to someone else. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's more of an ego thing on my own part where they're like, Jamie had to do this. And it's like, Jamie didn't have to do that. Jamie chose to do it wrong. So he still has a lot of the fundamentals in there. Um, but I'd say the way he differs from Harper the most is that Harper has more advanced rigging. Um, all of it would be production ready. Uh, Rick is really just to demonstrate the fundamentals um, and just to try that one experiment. Uh, th there's a lot of kind of unpublished rigs uh that i tend to kind of play around with um i think this is the guy i was working on last year that time wasn't on my side for oh wow or no display one so like this is spongebob you know and it's like or it was spongebob where have you gone buddy <laughs> well there's spongebob's eyes for you at the very least spongebob Ooh. in the dark <laughs> yeah i should get a black color card in uh yeah it just looks like all of his elements are off at the moment i wasn't planning on showing off this guy <laughs> ah spongebob you're letting me down buddy so is it something that you do frequently that you like look at character designs and try to figure out how you would rig it if it was uh, rigged instead of traditionally animated? Well, sorry, can you repeat that? Is that like an exercise that you find useful, like going through uh, like character designs and figuring out how to rig them? I mean, it is useful as an exercise. Um, the truth is rigging is actually quite fun. So <laughs> sometimes I'm just doing it for fun. Um, there is a lot of times where you're just kind of curious as well about a certain problem, as I was mentioning, that you couldn't do in a production. Uh, one of the guys who I was working on there a while ago was, there was a game called Hollow Knight, and <laughs> it was a game I was a really, really big fan of, and I remember this boss came up and I was like, this is going to be a hard boss to play with, uh, play against. Rig display one. I think none of my guys just want to show up today. There he is. So we have this character called Nightmare King Grimm. Uh, he's meant to have a different palette going on. And he's one of these kind of characters that I was kind of working on in my spare time, just because I was like, how do you handle this guy's jacket? Like there's so many things going on. There's a lot of other elements about him which aren't as fun. Like the head is actually quite simple. The, the legs aren't really challenging at all. But capes are always one of these things that kind of comes up that I have a nice solution for um, on a production. But I was looking at this guy while I was playing the game, and I was like, if he was a rotation rig, he'd be a nightmare. No pun intended. But he, yeah, he, you have all those different layers and elements. So much to twist around, too. And even in his case, he had such kind of limited art. Um, it was kind of a pixel art. So even getting the reference to do a rotation for him was quite hard, and I kind of had to make it up myself. I'm not sure if the rotation's actually in this guy. But uh, that was quite challenging in itself. But hold on, I'll go back to Harper. So there is kind of a lot of unpublished rigs as well, where it's a case of um, I'm just doing it for fun, really. So we were talking rig. earlier about um, how you'd been uh, exploring like different versions of Harmony and how it like uh, impacted what you could do with the rigs. Um, but like broadly, has your approach to rigging changed throughout your career? Yeah, yeah, I definitely say it has. Um, I've been rigging since uh, 2017, start of 2017, something like that, maybe 2016. Um, and it was one of these things where uh, it kind of evolved a lot, where the first two years was just kind of like there was so much to learn, so much to get my head around. And then after about two years, I was, like, I was kind of like, OK, I think I know it all. There's a few things I don't know here and there, but I think I know most of it. Like the learning curve seemed to be kind of uh, <laughs> like uh, steadying off of it. Uh, and then it was like, oh, I don't know about this. Let's let's see how deep this rabbit hole is. Oh my God, I don't know anything. 
So it's one of these things where um, uh, there's so much to learn that like as you're going with um, with your career, like you'll think it's leveling off and then you'll discover there's, there's so much more. Um, I remember after that two year phase as well, uh, I think a lot of riggers kind of go through this phase where they do want to do something a bit more experimental with good intentions thinking like this will actually cut a lot of uh, animators work down in half. Um, and it would if they had your brain and how you would do it if you were doing that scene, which unfortunately people don't have the same brain. Well, no, actually fortunately I would say. But so it, it kind of went into this phase where I was doing that for maybe a few months. Um, but ultimately the answer is just keep it simple. Like um, doing this a couple of years and like the conclusion I've reached to at, at this point is like, just keep it simple. It's like, make it simple for the animators to do their best work. Don't try to do the work for them. Um, so a lot of it changes like that. Um, before I used to focus a lot on precision where now a lot of it is precision and speed, like try to get both of them in the rig. Um, but a lot of it also will depend on like uh, the budget for the show, the ambition for the show. Um, how big the team is, what their deadlines are going to be like in animation. Uh, so you got to factor all of that in. You, you can't do anything fancy if there's no time to actually make it, and then the animators have no time to fix it. Um, and if you are including a lot of stuff as well, uh, which is very experimental, um, it might break one of the days that an animator doesn't really understand how, and it doesn't even matter how junior or senior the animator is. It's like you've come up with this very specialized method that you know how to make work, that they don't know how to make work. They don't know how to fix it um, because maybe your experiment had some flaws in it. So it's one of these things where it's like, again, what we were going back to saying about the node view, keep it simple, keep everything simple for the benefit of the animators. Um, there's no point like trying to show off like the best rig in the world if the animators don't understand how it works. I, I remember a friend of mine was working with a company um, where they were doing some service work and a rig was sent over and it had all these bells and whistles and do all these very fancy things but they had to send it back and get in touch with them after three days because they didn't know how to work it like they couldn't figure it out whereas i was saying before when you make a rig you kind of want to be able to have the option to leave an animator in a room alone with it and that they can figure it out and find all these features um there's certain things where uh, like especially in the case of Harper and her mouth, that's kind of a little bit of a hidden feature that you kind of need to give them a heads up about. Um, so I do tend to like do tutorials as well, but the aim of the game is hopefully they could figure it out by themselves if they had to in that situation. Yeah, I always think it's interesting when you have like a studio that makes a rig and they give it to another studio and it works in like Studio A, and then Studio B gets a hold of it and it's like, what is this? We don't know how to use it. Please help. <laughs> it's uh, there can be a oh, real oh, oh no, not at all. As a rigger, the funniest thing is anytime you start a new show, the animators are generally kind of like, hey, can you just make the rig that I? that I used to work with. And you're like, well, I didn't used to work with that rig. I don't know that rig, so no. And they're like, oh, OK, I thought I'd ask. <laughs> so yeah, everyone, especially with animators, like they have to be so kind of versatile. Like They have to learn a lot of kind of the riggers techniques as well from studio to studio, um, especially because like riggers, uh, some can be very set in their ways about like what they think is right. Like I frequently go to. Um, have uh, the riggers around Kilkenny, we, we go and have a meal together once in a while. And a lot of it kind of, uh, the conversation devolves into, never ever do this when you're always do this. And they're like, you do that, never do that. And it's always all uh, a lot of kind of hearsay and kind of like rumors and old wife tales about uh, the no. How could you use a two point constraint? <laughs> yeah. Like it, it's all of these kind of things as well, where it turns into theory. Um, we don't tend to focus too much on it. Uh, it. It's one of those things in the industry where it's like um, certain people love the shop talk and then other people are kind of like, let's limit the shop talk. And it's like, you got to respect that. Um, we've kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, but as someone with a creative career, uh, how do you stay motivated to work on projects in your spare time? It's, it's definitely hard. Um, I'm kind of lucky from a from a rigging background. 
this might be a controversial thing to say, but I've never really felt that rigging scratches the artistic itch, which is great for me because like this is still really, really creative. It's a lot of fun. I I love rigging. I left it for a few months to go uh, be an animator and it just called me back. I was a node view junkie by that point. So I just had to go back, but um, it's, sorry, I've forgotten your question now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, the, I think the question was just how do you stay motivated to yes. work on projects in your spare time? It's it's nice for me because I still kind of have the artistic itch uh, for after work. So I still love to draw because it's not something I'm doing all the time. But I still like to rig in my spare time as well. So to be honest, I think a huge thing is it's very hard to divide your motivations where nine to five, you're really, really kind of, it, it's all about uh, the show and you get very emotionally involved very easily. Um, and like, you know, your heart can break for a show, your heart can fill for a show, but you want to keep a little bit of the heart for your own project as well. So it, it's kind of about having boundaries um, on both sides of the fence, because sometimes you can give too much of yourself to the project you're working on and then the evening you totally burnt yourself out but there has been plenty of times that i've had to learn from where i'm doing some evening work myself and then i'm totally burned out by the next day it's like i, I turn off the computer at 11 o'clock or one o'clock um and then at nine o'clock i'm looking at the exact same software and that can be a but the whole time as well you're thinking about your own personal project so it's kind of nice to have boundaries uh for both of them so you, you're not kind of burning yourself out with either or. Um, and I think that that's a real key thing. Scheduling for sure. Um, guys, if, if you want to uh, appreciate production, like do your own do your own show and burn yourself out and you'll really appreciate how uh, scheduling can really help you out. Um, I remember I, I, from my own personal project, uh, which Harper was involved in, which frequently comes on and off the shelf. Um, I kind of had to set it to just like, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing is scale as well for the project. Um, if you have this grand idea in your head, but you're planning to do it all by yourself, it's like, you know, is it realistically something you can achieve by yourself? Um, it's kind of annoying to commit to a, an idea that might take you 20 years when you have all these other ideas floating around. So I think there is a healthy balance there for sure to find. Um, but it also was up to the individual a little bit of introspection to kind of land um, on what works best for you. We got a question from the audience. Um, oh. And I think it's an interesting one. Uh, so on, in terms of like shadows and highlights, is that something that you like when it's in a rig or <laughs> do you prefer when it's uh, left to the compositing team? Um, so in... Uh, in show breakdowns, like if you're kind of going to an animatic and talking about how you're going to do it, one of the biggest flags I usually have is uh, shadow. Um, it can be very, very expensive, uh, especially to animate. Um, you got to remember, like the characters are just bluffs. There's no actual surface there. So the shadow itself also has to then be a bluff. But it's such a technical aspect with shadow that um, to do it right and make sure that the eye is going to see it correctly, because if the shadow is off, then the eye is naturally going to catch it being wrong. Um, it's one of these things I, I tend to, in television, tend to tell people, like, let's tone down the shadow or uh, cap our expectations for it. I generally do prefer the compositing handle it, um, just because if you're putting in a lot of shadow elements into the rig, it's also going to make the rig like twice as heavy, depending on the shadow that you're hoping to achieve. Um, I remember before that, I was working on a show where I went into the meeting and we were like, we're doing a noir episode. And like, no, we're not. No, we're not. And <laughs> turns out we were. Um, and what's it called? We got it done at the end. But there was a lot of compromises. Shadow shadow is a very scary thing for a rigger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, with, with noir, like the entire point of that like genre is just like, we're going to really play with lighting. <laughs> going to really focus down, make everything monochrome. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> You know, work with gradients of of just black and white, and I guess it'd be challenging. 
but like also like on a production there's a whole range of like what shadows could be like they could just be like we're going to offset you know a character and have it cut itself and and have that be like a really cheap like, yeah. quick shadow or what you could do is you could have these like vector lines that you the animators have to move around um and like very precisely uh and i think the results are sometimes better with that method um but then it takes a lot more work yeah it definitely goes with uh with the style as well like um if that type of shadow actually complements the style that uh the designs are in because sometimes it can be a little bit more anatomically correct and uh the shadow really has to actually look um kind of almost realistic uh as you suggested, that's that tends to be what I kind of like uh, force upon design and just be like, we're just doing this. This is what we can afford. This is what's manageable in the week we have to do this episode. So um, yeah, uh, to be honest, I think it always ends up tending to complement the design as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting because in a lot of cases, it's not that there's like a right or wrong way to handle something. But the question is, how much time do you have, exactly. and how many people are working on this, and how important is it really to you at the end of the day? It's one of the things I always find myself saying is like, everything can be rigged. It's just, should it be rigged? Like, for the time it's going to take, for the heaviness, like, does it have to be this exact design? Like, maybe we can take that vertical stripe off the arm, for example. Do you know, it's. Um, it all is design dependent at the end of the day. The amount of times I get asked uh, by production, like if I can kind of make a guide, like how long does it take to do, you know, uh, a piece of string, so to speak. Uh, and you're like, well, how long is this piece of string? Like it, it's all visually dependent. So it's very hard to be able to turn around and say like, you know, read a script and it's like a character is sawing. And it's like, well, is there a shine in the saw? What's the handle of the saw like? Like how gritted is the teeth? Like is there perspective happening in the shot? They all break down to dance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, does the saw break and into dance? And all hell breaks loose. Oh, so it, it's one of those things where it, you can't really flag how bad it's all gonna be until we actually have a visual indicator. So it's a, uh, it's, it's something I really wish I could do for the, uh, the production, production departments, but um, yeah, it, it's always a hard ask. What skills do you think are important for artists who are interested in pursuing character rigging as a career? Uh, it definitely helps to be um, have some animation skills under your belt. Uh, like you are really kind of having an understanding of how the animator is going to work and the practices and the frustrations that they deal with, um, having that perspective is really, really beneficial because like you're able to kind of think like an animator and approach the problems like an animator. Um, I think to, one of the things I find that's really, really helpful is your perspective on it. Um, because the amount of time, <laughs> I remember a friend came up to me who's, um, who works professionally as a draftsman and he was like i don't know how you do rigging i don't know how you, like it sounds so boring and it was just one of these things where it's like yeah because you're looking at it totally wrong for me uh, you mentioned in my intro that i always kind of see it as a game it's a puzzle it's a jigsaw um and it offers so much variety and kind of like it can really make your your brain kind of go into overdrive to really kind of get around some problems um, and if you think of it like that, like it's a game that there's a time limit, it's a bit of a jigsaw, it's a puzzle to figure out, it's a lot more enjoyable. And, and anytime I try to, uh, uh, anytime I taught a junior into rigging, it, that's the perspective I really want them to look at it like. Um, if it's a case of just like, this cutter goes here, this cutter goes here, and they don't even understand the process, like you're never ever going to enjoy rigging. But the amount of people I know in rigging that just, they can't get away from it. As I said, I went to animation for like a couple of months and um, <laughs> even on that job, I ended up rigging for them. Uh, they were a flash company. I was, I think about three months in, I was like, you guys should really use Toon Room. And then there was one day where uh, the, the, the pipeline had kind of halted and they were like, there's no work for you, Jamie. Is there anything you want to do for this day? And I was like, let me show you what Harmony can do. And then we ended up just making it a Harmony show. <laughs> So um, yeah, it, it's 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 very addictive, um, and I think if if you don't see that appeal in the first 
three months, it's probably not for you. Um, that's the honest truth. Uh, I know a lot of people in the industry, the artistic itch is what they want scratched. Whereas for rigging, I find it's, it's a much more creative role. Like it's a very creative role, but it, it, it will not scratch that itch. And if that's important to you in your profession, rigging is not going to be uh, for you, but like, you're always going to have that for yourself after work. And in fact, one of the things that ended up getting me into rigging, um, there was a girl I went to college with who um, I wouldn't say I even knew her very well, but she was one of these people who kind of do it all. Uh, she just had a natural flair for all aspects of animation. She was great. And like, I remember we were all genuinely kind of curious, like, what is she going to go into? And um, I think I overheard her saying this to uh, another friend where they asked her, like, what are you going to go into? And she says, I want to be a compositor. And we were all kind of like, wow, I thought she was going to be, you know, an art director or um, an animator. Like, you know, it's like, it wasn't expecting compositor. And uh, she said something that I just thought was so, like, wise beyond the ears. She's like, I want to keep drawing for me. The amount of people I know in the industry who don't draw outside of work because they kind of hate it or it just feels like work now or it has to be, you know, for, uh, you know, their LinkedIn or their Tumblr posts uh, for publicity and kind of get their name out there and just all that pressure. It's not fun anymore. Uh, and I was like, that just makes so much sense to me. So I still draw for myself. Like um, every week I'm drawing. It mightn't be every night, but like it's still just fun for me. Um, I'm not much of an exhibitionist. Uh, so like it's a lot of it ends up only kind of getting 70% done, but it's just for me. Um, and it's kind of great to have that to be able to be in the animation industry, to still work creatively, to 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 get to do these puzzles for a living, but still have art for me. So I do love that. Jamie, um, what was your path into the animation industry? How did you uh, get to become a rigging artist? <laughs> um, it was one of these things where um, I was one of these kids who always wanted to be an animator. Um, and then I kind of got into animation college and I loved it. And then by the end of it, I was kind of like, you know what? I actually don't like the actual animating prospect. Like I, I, I don't enjoy animating. And I was like, oh no, you just got a degree in animation. You plan to become an animator and you don't like it. Like that's kind of bad. And I was like very stressed by that. Um, and at the time I had specialized in Adobe Flash and this is maybe about 2014. And it was very, it was very apparent to me that there was going to be a new top dog very soon. So I ended up going out to a course that was teaching uh, animation or uh, Doom Boom. Um, I actually missed my graduation to do the course, and I um, they were teaching Toon Boom uh, through the medium of rigging. So you would learn rigging first. And I was kind of doing the course, and I think it was like, you know, three hours uh, once a week for six to eight weeks or something like that. And I think outside of that, I was kind of like, okay, after that was done, I was like, yeah, I, I think I understand how rigging works now, and I enjoy it. Um, and then I kind of, I was talking to the instructor, and he showed me, like, a professional rig that he was working on, and it just blew my mind like the no view was terrifying even though it was neat it was still terrifying just because we were working very simply very small and to see this giant elaborate node view it actually just piqued my interest and i'd really enjoyed the course so then i was like i would love to try rigging uh, and eventually go into animation like the idea was like try rigging for a few years and then for, uh, go back to animation because i didn't really expect to fall in love with it but um, my first company was Boulder. They were very kind of taking me on, and uh, they they kind of showed me how vast it was. And the crew there really enjoyed uh, the prospect of rigging. Like, we all really loved it. Like most riggers who are rigging love to rig. Like they really do. Um, so it was just infectious. And then, as I said, I went off and did animation for a couple of months, and I was like, no, it's it's all about rigging. Like. Uh, I kind of stumbled into rigging. It was never something I thought was going to be um, the end, the end goal, uh, especially because like I was uh, a flash specialist, and yeah, uh, rigging in flash isn't as um, engaging. Uh, leave it at that. 
so yeah, yeah, it 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 scratches an itch that nothing else does. Like honestly. All right, we are almost out of time. Jamie, where can our audience find more of your work? Ooh, that is a good question. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not much of an exhibitionist, but I'm hoping to do some tutorials uh, at 5 a.m. continues on YouTube. Um, look me up on LinkedIn, uh, always like networking. Um, and I just made a new portfolio site on Canva but I don't know if it has the tags yet, so you might have a hard time finding me, guys. But uh, yeah, that's definitely a start at the very least. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Jamie, for joining us on this live stream to discuss your work rigging Harper. And thank you to our audience for tuning in as well. Uh, you can catch our next stream on Tuesday, January 23rd. It'll be an art stream with Maria Vlasel, AKA the Bird Brain, and uh, special guest Chloe McChesney, a recent BFA of UW Stout. Toon Boom is turning 30 in 2024, and we wanted to celebrate by hosting interviews with animation studios, especially those that make excellent use of our software. So our first interview in that series takes place next week on Thursday, January 25th, with Atomic Cartoons, the studio behind Last Kids on Earth. We know that if you enjoyed the stream, you won't want to miss next week's interview. So thank you for watching, and be sure to tune in next time.